Good morning. So glad that you guys are all here. Um, I am just going to pray real quick uh, to get us started. God, we come before you this morning. We are here because we desire to encounter you. And so, Holy Spirit, we ask that you would move. Would you open our eyes, our ears, our hearts? Would you help us to hear you this morning? Would you help me to faithfully and rightly present your word? God, we give you this time. We entrust it to you. And we declare in advance that you are good. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Well, you guys, we've been talking about worship. We've been in that rhythm for this last month. Um, And this last week and even this morning, um, I must say, God is still teaching me. Like, I am in an active place of learning about worship, um, even as I came in this morning and as I stand here before you. So... Um, we're all prepared, and also, we joked a little bit, today might be a bit of a choose-your-own-adventure. Um, I One of the things that, so there's a couple of things I want to say up front. Um, because then when we're talking about worship, I think a lot of us feel like, so A, we define it as this singing time that we just experienced here in this room. Worship is so much more than that. It is so much more than that. Um, But when we're in this room and we're thinking about worship and we're looking around the room and we're like, this doesn't feel like it fits, right? Like, so I grew up in a tradition, I grew up in the church, but I grew up in a tradition where we didn't, you didn't move, like you stood at your chair and your hands did not go in the air and you were very still and it was a very reverent and that is beautiful and lovely and I am grateful for that history in my life. But I will also tell you this, I consistently felt like I couldn't figure it out and I didn't fit. I felt like I must be doing something wrong because it just didn't resonate with me. I felt like I wanted something different, something more And so I felt like that was something I needed to figure out inside myself, right? There was something wrong with me. Then we were living in Seoul, South Korea, and I went to a women's Bible study. And I saw women standing in a time of worship with their hands raised. They like swayed back and forth. I was stepping back because I was pretty sure lightning was going to (laughs) strike. And I didn't want to get caught in it. But that was a place where I learned that there are multiple ways of expressing our worship. And I finally no longer felt like a square peg trying to fit into a round hole. I am so incredibly grateful for the freedom that we have here at Grace Chapel in our times of worship. And whether you're a sitter or a stander or a kneeler or a layer, a hands up, a hands down, whatever that looks like, there is room for that. And then I know that for some of you, you're like, I, we just sat around a table on Friday night and had a conversation about worship. And someone said, that is not how I meet God. I do not meet God in that organized space of the worship songs during a Sunday morning. And he said, he goes, the way I worship in those moments is by not complaining. It's by continuing to show up. It's by saying, even though that's not my preference, I recognize and I, have, and I value the space for that. And so I'm going to be there and I'm going to be present and I'm going to show up and I'm not going to complain. You guys, that's an act of worship. And so wherever you are on that sphere, right? So you may be sitting here and you may be like, how I define worship, how I experience worship is out in nature. So sorry, we cannot bring trees in here. It's not an option, all right? It may be in community. As we sat around that table Friday night, we all talked about the fact this was a form of worship, us sitting around that table with one another. That's a little bit harder to do on a Sunday morning too, right? For others, it's a sacrifice. Now, that's something we can easily bring on a Sunday morning, 
But not every piece of worship, not every way that we worship can fit into this space. But what does it look like, no matter what the way that at the core of you, your heart, your spirit, your soul, the way that you connect closest to God, how do we still walk into this space? And how do we respect and revere this space? And how do we find that place of connecting with God when we are in spaces that aren't maybe our first preference? So that's kind of a little bit of the challenge. Now, we have been talking, we started this back in February. It started way before that. It started several years ago where we talked about as followers of Jesus, we live through different seasons in our life. We showed you the grid where we talked about God feels close or God feels distant. Life is good or life is hard. Back in February, we did a discipleship survey. So if you were here, you may have filled that out. We asked you to identify which season would you say that you are in, that you most closely identify with in this moment in your life? Now, we made a commitment and said, anyone who said on that survey, God feels far away and life is hard, that we wanted to follow up with you. Because of that, I've gotten to have so many conversations. And I am so grateful for the ways that you have been open, you have been honest, you have been raw, you have been authentic. And I am so incredibly grateful for that because let this never be a place where you feel like you have to put on a mask to show up. Where you have to look a certain way to be a part of this family of Jesus. So today, we're going to talk about what does it look like to worship in each of those seasons. What does our worship look like? What kind of faith do we have in each of those seasons that our worship stems out of? What are the enemies of our worship in each of those seasons? Because I know I've lived through all of those seasons, and I'm sure every one of you have as well. So also has King David. So you guys, we're going to start in 1 Samuel 16 this morning. So if you have your Bible, feel free to pull it out. And we're just going to keep going through all the Samuels today. All right? <clears throat> now, I'm going to talk more in story form, but the verses will go up there. All right? How do we worship in every season? So first, let's set up David's life. All right? David um, was the eighth son of a man named Jesse who lived in Bethlehem. Israel, after they had escaped from Egypt and they wandered in the wilderness and then they'd come into the promised land, they noticed both in the wilderness and in the promised land, the majority of the people groups had a king. And so they're like, we want a king too. And God's like, I don't think you do. You don't really know what you're asking for. And they're like, yes, we do. Um, so he gave them a king. And he gave them King Saul. And King Saul was a great king until he wasn't, um, where the job went to his head a little bit, and he started leaning on his own wisdom, his own strength, instead of continuing to depend on God, to the point that he rebelled radically from God. And so God ended up removing his favor from Saul as king. So God wanted to choose a new king. So he sent Samuel to anoint the new king. He sent him to this home of Jesse in Bethlehem. Son number one comes walking up, and he is tall, he is handsome, he is smart, he is strong. Think like Batman, Captain America, Michael Phelps. All right? And Samuel's like, dude, this must be the guy. And God's like, nope, it's not him. Son number two comes up, pretty similar. Samuel's like, then this must be. Nope. No, 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 no. Finally, they call in boy number eight, who was still in the field because they were pretty sure it wasn't him and it wasn't important for him to be in the room. And he comes walking in the room and God says, this is him. This is a man after my own heart. And Samuel anoints David as the next king. Awkward, though, because Saul's still sitting on the throne. So what do you do when you've been anointed but the platform doesn't exist for you yet. How did David live in that season? David continued as a shepherd. He kept taking care of his dad's sheep. And then he got a second job because King Saul was an emotional kind of man and he would get anxious and he would have kind of fits 
And so what he wanted, he asked somebody, is there anybody that can play music really well that could come in and play when I get worked up to help calm me down? And they're like, yes, David in Bethlehem. He's great on the harp, the lute, whatever, the lyre, whichever one it was he played. And Saul's like, great. So now David has two jobs. Anointed king, his two jobs are caring for his dad's sheep and playing music for Saul when Saul gets anxious. Well, Saul gets a little jealous of David, throws a spear at him, and yet David keeps showing up. And then there's a war. The Philistines have gone to war against the Israelites. All, uh, several of David's brothers, three of them I believe it was, were, went to war. So they're on the front lines. Well, the Philistines had a champion named Goliath who would come out and he would challenge the Israelites and he would mock them and he would mock their God. And, but the Israelites were afraid of him and no one would go and fight him. David's father said, hey, Take this food to your brothers out at the front lines and find out what's happening with the war. Like, bring a report back. So David goes and he takes the food. And while he's there, he hears Goliath come out, challenge, mock. And he looks around and he's like, why isn't anybody fighting him? Like, we're the Israelites. We're God's people. Like, why is no one going? Well, his brothers hear that he's asking these questions. And they're not happy about it. And they find him and they say, dude, shut up and go home. You are not welcome here. We don't want you here. And David says to them, what have I done? Can I not speak? David's life continues where things aren't going great. Still anointed king, but still not going great. Saul tries to kill him again, throwing the javelin while he's playing the music. Clearly it wasn't working. And so David runs away, and he runs into the wilderness now, before he fully runs away, he runs away because his best friend was Saul's son. And so his son is like, my dad's not trying to kill you. It was an accident. It slipped out of his hand. Like, let me just find out. Let me find out the heart of my dad towards you before you fully run away. All right? So Jonathan has a conversation with Saul and then meets up with David. And he's like, oh, no, yeah, he's definitely trying to kill you and you should run away. And David looks at Jonathan and says, what have I done? While David is fleeing from Saul in the wilderness, Saul is now chasing him in the wilderness. Saul ends up on his own by himself, and David is close enough to him he could have killed him. And instead, he takes something to prove how close he was, and then he challenges Saul himself and says, what have I done? Why are you coming after me? David was living in a season of desert, a season where God was close. He was living as the anointed king, but life was hard. It was not good. He didn't have a single place to lay his head. He had to keep getting up and running away again and again. The lie that the enemy loves to tell us in this season is you are a failure. Now, David wasn't hearing that from God, but he was definitely hearing it from every man in his life, right? His brothers get out of here. We don't need you. Saul, you have failed at this. You failed at that. The faith that we have to offer in a season when God feels close and life is hard is a persevering faith. It's the kind of faith that if you've been out on a long walk or a long run and you're headed home, but the last stretch is a fully uphill battle, but you go ahead and you do it. Right? That's a persevering faith. It says, like, life is hard, but I'm going to keep doing this. Because, God, I know you. Now, our enemy of our worship in that can be justice. David was living with a lot of injustices in this season. Life was hard, not because of things he had done, not because of choices he had made, but because of how others felt towards him. And so David could easily have gotten caught up in the stayed in that place of like, what have I done? And God, you need to fix this. But if we stay in that place where we're just looking for the justice, the outcome of justice becomes our goal, instead of the person of God, we will lose our worship. Okay, so that's a season of desert. David's life then moves into a season of delight. In Psalm... No, sorry, that's the wrong note. There we go. 
in 1 Samuel, um, 2 Samuel 5.12, it talks about the fact that David's kingdom is now established. Saul and Jonathan have died. David is now sitting on the throne. He's been crowned king of both Judah and Israel. The kingdoms are united under him. And he is experiencing a season of prosperity. It says that God gave him victory everywhere he turned. Life was good. And God felt close. David was in a season of delight. You know, it's interesting. Last February, when we did that survey, we talked about it in different teams um, here. And I talked about it with other groups of people. And I would say... I go, I would identify that I'm living in a season of delight. And you guys, it's the first time in 11 years that I would have said I was in a season of delight. And I was delighted. <laughs> right? And I found myself asking the question, God, what do I do? What do I do in this season to like, to like fill everything up so that when I'm not in this season anymore, like I've got overflow, right? Like I've got barn after barn after barn of all the good stuff so that when the hard seasons come... I'm good and I'm set and I'm ready to go. I don't know if you heard how many times I just said I. It's really easy in a season of delight. We hear a whispered lie that we have arrived. We've done it. This was the end goal, is living like this, where God feels close and life is good. That's my end goal. Here's the problem is, I think oftentimes we become complacent and maybe a little arrogant when we're living in a season of delight, where we start to make it, make it, it feels like it's maybe about us, like I am actually doing, like with God, but like I'm doing all of these things with God. We lose a dependency on God. We lose sometimes that desire to connect on a daily, regular basis. It's been interesting as I have been in this because I am regularly in the Word. Um, I pray pretty regularly. Um, But I sat in this place this week thinking about being in a season of delight and what does that mean and what does my worship look like in this season. And I realized a lot of the time I was spending in the Word was in preparation for something It was to come alongside someone else. It wasn't just to go to the word and encounter God and let him speak to my heart. A lot of my time in prayer has been praying for very specific things that are happening. I often pray heading into meetings. But the quiet still just sitting with God, letting him love me and loving him in return, which is what worship is. All of that had kind of gotten away. Because when I'm in a season of delight, I don't tend to feel that desperation, that need, that dependence. And yet, that is the place that God is inviting us to in every season. In that season of delight, we have a generous faith to offer, right? When I walk into a space, I walk into a meeting, and we're talking about what season we're in, and someone else says, I'm in a season of desert right now. Life is really hard. When I'm sitting in a season of delight, it's easy for me to come alongside. It's easy for me to sit with them, to give them whatever strength I can, to help remind them of the faithfulness of God, when sometimes it's hard for us to remember when we're in hard seasons, right? We have a very generous faith. David's generous faith went to this extent He reached out and he asked somebody, is there anybody left in Saul's household that I could bless? And he ended up bringing Jonathan's son, Mephibosheth, into Methuselah, whichever the one says, whichever the word says. Um, It's an M word. Into his own house. David's generous faith said, even though the house of Saul was angry because they kind of wanted to stay in the throne, And they didn't get to because God had already chosen David. David reached past that divide and invited someone from the other side in. One of them. A generous faith allows us to reach past 
our us's and them's and to step into things with the people that we might not otherwise. Now, one of the problems with having some complacency in our lives is we can get a little lazy, we can get a little lukewarm, and when that happens, we become a little vulnerable. Well, David, living in his season of delight, became a little too complacent. 2 Samuel 12, 11, starts by this. In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war. So, in this day, so A, the rains had just stopped. That's why springtime was when war happened, right? It was hard to fight a war in the mud, um, so they waited until things kind of dried up a little bit, and then they all went to war. Now, today, our leaders, we don't often see actually out leading the troops, like actively in the field. But in this day, every king did. Because if as a king, you did not go with your troops, you might set yourself up for having your throne usurped. Because the culture of this time, you might lose the hearts of your people because they cared a lot about safety and security and power. And so if you weren't part of the army that went and made sure that your kingdom still had safety and security and power, they might decide to pick the guy that did lead your army and get those things for you. So the kings always went with their armies. But David, this spring, did not. It was the first not great decision of several not great decisions because what happens next in 1 Samuel 12 changes the course of David's life forever. Because David did not go, he decided to go take a walk on his roof. And he's looking around, checking out everybody else's roof, looking in people's windows, which that's not cool. Um, like if you live in a neighborhood, we all are hoping that our neighbors aren't doing those things. But David is. Um, so... While he's doing that, he sees a beautiful woman bathing. Now, it would have been a great idea if he had looked away quickly and walked the other direction. David didn't. He decided to hang out and gaze. Um, so that was not ideal. And once he did that, then he inquired. He said, hey, who's that woman that lives in that house? Well, interestingly enough, the servant, when he answers him, says, isn't that Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Uriah, one of King David's highest generals in his army. So there is an assumption that more than likely David already knows exactly who Bathsheba is because he knows Uriah and he knows Uriah well. These guys hang out. And I find it interesting that the servant says it that way because I feel like that was the Holy Spirit kind of trying to prick at David's conscience. Like, dude, you're walking down a road that is not a good idea. But David ignored it. He invited Bathsheba over. And the rest of 2 Samuel 12 is him trying to cover up the fact that he slept with another man's wife. And he ends up killing his friend and general in his army, Uriah. Now, something I think it's really important for us to notice. This was a slow fade. David did not get up in the morning, send his army off to battle, and immediately call the woman next door because he had a plan all along. Instead, it was one decision after another, after another, a moment, in a moment, in a moment. And how often are we vulnerable to that? I don't think any of us probably wake up in the morning and say, I'm going to cheat on my spouse. But how often do we let ourselves be in a place that maybe we shouldn't be? Look at something that is not helpful or wholesome? Text or DM with somebody in a way that's maybe a little too familiar? Because in every single one of those moments, look at all of the moments that God gave David to turn it around. David should have gone to war he saw Bathsheba, he asked about her, he ignored the warning. 
and he invited her. That's a lot of steps. And at any one of those moments, if he had turned, would he have then stayed in that season of delight? Whereas now, because of his actions, and David doesn't even know it yet, he's moved into a season of distance. Because God is no longer as close as he once was, because God is not happy with the choices that David has made. But again, David is clueless. He's moved into a place of distance, but in his pride, in his trusting in himself, he isn't paying attention and he hasn't noticed. So Nathan comes, a priest, to tell him a story. King David, there was a man, a very rich man, And he had a lot of cattle and a lot of sheep. And he lived next door to a very poor man who had one little ewe. That man loved that ewe. That man cared for that ewe. He let it eat at his table. He let it sleep in his bed. Ew. He treated it like a daughter. But there was a traveler that came to the rich man. And the rich man, instead of taking one of his own cattle, one of his own sheep, he went next door and took the one little ewe from the poor man and butchered it and killed it to feed to the traveler. Well, David was enraged. And he said, that man must die. And Nathan looked at him and said, that man is you. In that moment, don't you just know, for David, every one of those decisions that he made kept ticking through his mind. I had this chance, I had this chance, I had this chance, I had this chance. And I went and I took the poor man's you. Because of that, how David's family lived in the world changed a little bit. Now, God had made a covenant with David and nothing ever changed that covenant. God had said, I am going to establish your line forever and nothing changed that. But they didn't live in the same level of peace and prosperity that God had that David and God had originally talked about because of the things that David had did. David had did. That's not good English. So now David is living in this season of distance where life was still pretty good, right? Like things were still going well for him. He was still experiencing victory, um, but God is now far away. What kind of faith do we offer in that? We offer a steady faith, a faith that says, even though I don't feel God, I still believe him. A faith that says, I'm going to stay in the game. And even though I can't see or hear my coach, I'm going to run the play. Because I trust that he wrote the play, so I'm going to run the play. That is a steady faith. The lie that we often hear in this season is that we're being ignored. When God feels far away, we're like, are you paying any attention? Do you hear me? Or do you not? Now, in all honesty, there are times that we find ourselves in a season of distance that have absolutely nothing to do with anything that we have done. There are times when God takes a step back. Here's the difference. When we are in a season of distance because of something that we have done, it is like we have created a chasm between us and God. When we are in a season of distance because God has taken a step back, there is an invitation in his step backedness. That invitation is to a deeper level of dependency. It's to having more of who he is revealed, more of who he calls us revealed. That kind of distance is just an opportunity for us to press in and to practice and to seek his face again and again and again and again. That is what the steady faith does, is it says, I believe you're there. Even if I can't see you, I can't feel you, I can't hear you right in this moment. Another season that is not always a result of our own actions We're going to read for David, it was, because that's another option. It's a season of darkness. Season of darkness is when life is hard and God feels really far away. David moved into a time where he lost his biological son that was born of that moment on the roof. 
to death. And then he had another son who rebelled against him as king, had himself crowned as king, and then went to try and kill his dad so that he could be king everywhere. So as a parent, that's not great. You've lost one son to death. You've lost another son to his own ego, and he wants to kill you. This is not a great place that we're living. David wrote some amazing psalms. In Psalm 22, David wrote this, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my crisis of anguish, my cries of anguish? My God, I cry out by day, but, to you, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest. The lie that the enemy tells us in a season of darkness is that we have been abandoned. God either just doesn't exist or he doesn't care about me. I'm sure many of you have felt that way at some point. I know I have. I spent an entire year wrestling hard with a God that I was pretty sure had just emotionally abandoned me. And I didn't know what to do with it. And I was looking for answers. Now, at the end of that year, I honestly had no answers. But what I did have, as I kept showing up, as I kept crying out, as I yelled at him, as I cursed at him, sorry, I know I'm a pastor, I'm not supposed to do that. As I cried to him, At the end of that year, I had a God that just kept showing up. He showed up for every moment of it. He never actually walked away. He could take all of it. We've all seen in a movie or a TV show or our homes that moment when I'm so angry and hurt and desperate and I'm just railing and beating on someone's chest, right? I can't tell you how many moments I had with God in that year. But at the end of it, he had shown up for every single one. He never once walked away. So though we hear the lie that we have been abandoned, we have a raw faith that we present in that. Now the enemy of our worship is despair in a season of darkness. If we spend too much time focused on the circumstances Rather than the person of God, we may fall into despair. But as we shift our eyes, as we focus on the person of God, even when we're struggling with him and fighting with him, it keeps us in a place of not falling into despair and being able to stay real and true and with him. We're going to do something this morning. Um, that is going to be new and different for almost everyone in the room. So, yay! Um, (laughs) um, But it's, uh, I've been sitting in this place, you know, we talked about the fact that worship looks so different for all of us, right? Um, We've talked about the fact that there are these four seasons, and there may be more. We're talking about these four, and I'm guessing that every single one of those seasons is represented in this room. Here's the other thing that I want to say before we go into this. Because when David went out to fight Goliath, Saul put his armor on David. David, who was a shepherd boy who had fought every battle before that with lions and bears with a sling and stones, David tried to put all of his armor on him. And David finally said, this is too heavy. I cannot fight like this. This is not how I engage. Worship is a weapon for us. It is a powerful weapon that God has given us to fight any and everything, every one of those lies and every other thing. But you guys, all of our worship looks different. And to have an expectation that my worship is going to look like Christine's worship, is going to look like Pat's worship, it's going to look like Doug's worship, is going to look like Jen's worship. 
is trying to put something on. It's trying to wield a weapon that we are unfamiliar with. So I want you to identify how do you meet God in a place of worship? And I want you to put words to that. One of the things David taught us, the majority of the Psalms were written by David. David was a prolific writer. And there's a power to putting actual words to the things that we are seeing and feeling and experiencing with God and in our lives. It's important for us to do it. I think a lot of times we live in this vague place of life is hard. What is hard? God feels far away. How does God feel far away? What does that look like for you? God feels so close right now. What does that look like? What do those moments look like? What's happening in your body, in your mind, in your heart, in your soul in those moments? What comes out of those moments? So we're going to write a psalm. Every single one of us is going to write a psalm this morning. Um, So recognizing that probably the majority of us have not done this, um, we've created a template. Um, So there is a template for each different season. So go ahead. You can QR code this. Or it's also on the app. If you have your phone, if you open up the Grace Chapel app, it's right there at the top of the feed. So you can also click on it there. Um, Like I said, I did this kind of Mad Lib style, if any of you guys know about Mad Libs, um, where there's a little bit of a fill in the blank um, with some guidance. Now, if you're comfortable in this space, feel free to write your psalm however you want to write your psalm. Um, But if this is new to you, we wanted everybody to be able to engage. And so that's why we created the templates. We are going to take the next four minutes. We're going to put some music on. And we're going to give everybody time to write their psalm. Now, you can do it on your phones. If you're a paper and pen person and you're like, I really need paper and pen, probably you showed up with a journal. Um, But if not, we do have paper and pens on the tables in the back, and then there's also a table, or front, this is the front, and there's a table in the back that has paper and pens also. So for the next four minutes, we're just going to sit in the music, and we're going to write a psalm, and then I'll transition us into the next
people from that, but I'm going to read Psalm 42 written by David as he was running from his one son. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night, while men say to me all day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go with the multitude, leading the procession to the house of God, with shouts of joy and thanksgiving among the festive throng. Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. My soul is downcast within me, therefore I will remember you. From the land of the Jordan, the heights of Hermon, from Mount Mazar, deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls, all your waves and breakers have swept over me. By day the Lord directs his love, at night his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony as my foes taunt me, saying to me all day long, where is your God? Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Worship is giving God glory, praising him, giving him at least the level of celebration that we give other things in our lives. What does worship look like in your life and what does worship look like today? Whether you are coming with a raw faith, a steady faith, a generous faith, or a persevering faith today, what does responding to the greatness of God look like in your life right now? We're going to head into a time of worship through singing and song. Um, and whatever that looks like for you, whether you want to stand, whether you want to sit, you want to kneel, you want to lay down on your face, you want to lift your arms, whether you want to spend that time in prayer with God or praying with another person, whatever that looks like for you today, would you respond to God in worship now? Holy Spirit, we trust you. We entrust you with this time. We ask that you would speak. We invite you to move us out of our comfortable. Let us be willing to be uncomfortable for you, God. As David said, let us be even more undignified in our worship. Because our worship is such a sacrifice and so different in how we live our life than how others live their lives. That people look at us and say, that's radical. God, thank you for the way that I've heard the way that you have shown up in people's lives over these last few weeks. Through the kindness of a stranger, stranger through an unexpected gift, through a reminder from your word that you are with us. You are here, you are present, you are in us, you are beside us, you are in front of us, you are behind us. And we thank you and we praise you, God, not because of what we bring, not because of what's happening in our life, but because you are God and you deserve glory for all the ways that you have been in our life, the way that you are today, and the ways that you will be showing up in our life. You are the same from the beginning of time until the end of time, and we praise you. God, you are God. You are our almighty one. You are the Lord of lords, the King of kings. You are the Alpha and Omega, beginning and the end. You are our Savior. You are our Redeemer. You are the lover of our souls. You are our friend. You are our Abba, Daddy, Father. And we praise you. 